Hi, this is Silver Dave. Um, it's Friday and Friday as well. It seems like now I'll be coming home a bit late. And uh, so I don't have any natural light to film a video to see the new coins I got. Um, I'll do that tomorrow. So Saturday morning, I'll show you some cool coins I got. I got a new coin that I didn't have in my stack. And I'm pretty excited by it. It's a, I don't want to spoil everything, but it's a really old coin and it's got some history behind it. And did I pay numismatic value? No, we are deal hunters. We like things to be on sort of sale or at least on a good deal. Um, so let's get into today's video. Uh, I came home a bit late, so I think today what we're going to do, and I think it'll be the main theme for Fridays because Fridays I come home late. Uh, we're going to do a little more chart analysis, at least try with my basic knowledge about how charts work and how, uh, how technical analysis works. And, and, and I was working on this for a little bit. Um, we're going to look at how to use machine learning. So I was looking at a few articles of how they were using machine learning to try and do technical analysis on the price of gold and have our computer do the technical analysis and build the relationships uh, of the price of gold related to multiple markets, right? It's very hard for an individual technical analyst to look at, let's say more than two or three markets. People tend to look when they look at the gold they, they typically pull out the gold's moving, like, uh, moving, uh, <laughs> gold's own moving, uh, moving averages, exponential moving averages, and the price movement of gold. And they also look at something like the VIX uh, volatility index. They try to look at uh, investor sentiment. And then they pull everything together and they're like, okay, and then we do some chart formations, right? And we will look at that. We'll look at some things that I've seen look see in the charts um, over the current period. And then I'll show you what I've been working on in terms of machine learning and trying to understand a little bit how to use uh, machine data to to sort of like do some predictions. It's it's not like it's a crystal ball <laughs> you can tell the future. But I think it's fun. It's a fun thing to explore. And, uh, you know, and not everything here has to be serious. So what, have, what, have, what do we have in front of us? Well, I pulled up sort of the, uh, the gold price chart. And you're wondering why I'm doing it on gold. Because personally, I, I would do it on silver. But silver is so volatile that I, I don't think that I have a good enough grasp of uh, technical analysis and sort of the understanding of all the inner workings to be able to do uh, silver yet. Potentially, I'll maybe if I get better, I do a little bit more reading and digging, um, I might get a little bit better. Uh, so one of the things that's been happening over the past few days is uh, there's sort of this angst within both the stacking community and online, and you see all these like uh, analysts, they're, they're angsty because it seems like we're going into a bear market. And the reason why they're angsty was that possibly I would say at least two to three weeks ago, everybody was expecting a bull market. They're not expecting a bear market to form right now. And in some ways, um, there were indicators that indicated that potentially we were going to be in a bear market. And I want to just look at them and see maybe in the future, you know, these could be things that we could look out for um, if we think that, you know, there's going to be an inversion in the price of gold and other precious metals. So what have I noticed when I pulled up, when I start comparing exponential moving averages? Uh, one of the things I like to compare, and it's, uh, I think it is a common indicator, is the, uh, it's called the, it's called the, MACV oscillator and you compare basically two different exponential moving average periods with each other and what I did here was I am comparing the 12 day exponential moving average over the period of one day versus the 24 uh, exponential moving average which is of one day periods um, you can also do this with half days if you want to look at more details 
Um, but the one day one for a larger picture is a little bit better. So what has happened? Um, we can say it was pretty good confidence that, you know, the markets overall, everything crashed in March when the initial lockdowns happened. And during the crash, we saw the price move downwards. But there is a point during the crash, like a little bit afterwards when the prices start going back up, you can see that there was an inversion. It's pretty clear in the oscillator that the direction of the short-term moving average moved positive much faster than the uh, than the uh, than the longer term 24 day exponential moving average and then this typically this isn't always but sometimes this leads into a longer period of a bull market and that's what happened we had this period where we had a uh from the 19th of march i would say all the way until uh the 7th of august it was a bull market and we were going upwards 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 you can see that the short term exponential moving average there is quite a gap for it compared to the long term exponential moving average right there are periods where it got close and then it sort of moved back up again um, it never crossed but then there were points where it almost crossed but then something else happened during this period during the period when we were in the 10th of august we had a correction we had a market crash for gold um you can call it whatever you want you're like yeah but it's not really it is a crash it's essentially we had an initial crash we had a massive run up and then we had a really big crash this is i would say this type of movement such such a such a huge movement that means that we move from 2000 to the 1800 level um we're looking at yeah it's a hundred dollar move is uh we see multiple hundred dollar moves downwards. It's a, it's not so common, you know, gold doesn't really do uh, so many hundred dollar moves. Um, even if you look at over the course of a few days, if you look at the past periods, I mean, gold, when it goes into a sort of bear market, it does it slowly. It doesn't do massive, massive, massive um, moves that it's currently doing right now. So, but right now it's doing that it's moving downwards and we're having we're going into a downward trend and the point where we were already in a potential bear market was actually right after the 10th of august you can see that the short-term exponential moving average is closing in onto the long-term expo exponential moving average and if they do cross it is a potential point where you are going into a bear market, right? And your assets start looking as if they are getting into a, um, into potentially an oversold territory. Now, why am I saying that? Why am I saying that in the bear market, it's potentially oversold? Well, there are points where it could be potentially oversold, but if it stays too long in the oversold period, it can also consolidate at that level, which means that it can go into a new oversold period. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So in September, we had another downward trend. And in this period in September, I think if we look at the uh, stochastic indicators and so on, if you're a technical analysis, we moved a lot. We moved almost a $100 drop. We have multiple $100 drops. This isn't over one day. It's over one, two, three, three days. We have $100 drops. And I think that that was a period when the it was sort of a pre-election period and people didn't know who was going to win yet. And there was sort of a market correction. People were already, they, they wanted to exit the market at this point before the election because the election has uncertainty they wouldn't know how to price the price of gold based upon the current policies because the next president is not known so a lot of people exited which could explain this drop and then we saw that you know there is quite a big difference between the short term and the long term exponential moving averages and the short term is lower than the long term but but you know once this correction happened and the people who didn't want to be in the market before the elections um, and didn't want to deal with basically the uncertainty of who was going to win and didn't want to take that bet was done 
everybody else who wanted to make that bet start joining the market, right? At 1858, it's like, it's not a bad price to join. It's not a great price to join. We're not talking about 1700 uh, level prices. That was prior at the beginning of the pandemic and prior to, uh, what would you call it? The first quantity easing measures taken by the Federal Reserve. Um, we're in a position where it's okay. The price isn't too bad. It's not too great. It's not too bad. So some people start joining and they're making bets on who's going to win. And I think that at a certain point, people were betting that Biden would win. There would be a blue wave. There would be more stimulus. And it was looking like that. You know, post-election, we kind of had like, you know, we had the res some of the results come in, some of the results come in, some of the results come in. And we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let me check. USA election date was November 3rd. Yeah. So prior to November 3rd, we saw everybody price things in and we didn't see too much of a drop before November 3rd. Um, and at November 3rd, this is something that's very interesting. Right at the point where you can see that there is November 3rd, we're going to zoom in here. We, are, we have a sort of a mini inversion, right? We have this point where the short-term moving average is approaching the long-term moving average. There's some correction, but we see a strong correction upwards of the short-term moving average. And it's funny that right after the election where Biden wins, people price in, there's going to be fiscal stimulus because there's a Biden victory. Democrats are looking good. They potentially might win the Senate or not, but most likely we are going to be in a stronger position to have fiscal stimulus. There's going to be more or less status quo. There is a raging pandemic going on. Um, we think that price of precious metals is going to shoot upwards. All the stars are aligned. And people are like, okay, all the bad news is here. We're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, they, they align their stars and they're like, it's safe to buy. And then you see this huge jump right after November 3rd. People are buying, buying, buying gold. And they're still moving upwards. And we can see the momentum that finally this is between. That means that at this point, since the last drop prior to election, since the last inversion, at this point, we see an inversion upwards. That means that we're potentially going into bull market territory. And I think if at this point, the next thing that came didn't happen, uh, we will be telling a different story today. But the next thing happened, and the next thing was we got the vaccine. We got the Pfizer vaccine with a 90% efficacy rate. And then... So everybody who bought into it and who didn't want to deal with the fact that there was a vaccine sold. And I think a lot of people, they were expecting the situation to be uh, to clear up pretty quickly with a vaccine. We saw this in the stock market. That means that the vaccine news, people reacted so strongly to the vaccine news. And there's so much exuberance that they kind of are forgetting that, you know, there's whole industries that are gone because, because of the pandemic, you know, the whole travel industry, it's, it's completely gone. The, um, I would say the passenger flight industry, I think the pa sort of the flight industry, part of it might be replaced um, by sort of the cargo and freight sort of uh, industry, uh, freight air, tra air cargo industry. But the, the passenger industry, it will take some time for it to recover. No matter how cheap the passenger prices are, you know, maybe they'll convert a lot of the passenger planes into cargo planes because people have realized they can order stuff and they can pretty much live the life they were living, like in terms of consumption, um, if they have money without leaving their homes. And it's not so inconvenient. It's okay, <laughs> you know, to order stuff. And people are adopting ordering packages and ordering goods and services. I think this Christmas, um, we'll see a lot of people or order presents instead of going to buy them in store. And that will change how people people's purchasing habits. It doesn't mean that people won't go back to physical shopping. It just means that um, people will most likely be buying uh, more online and be more comfortable buying online. So 
at this point, on November 9th, we have the Pfizer vaccine come out. It's 90% efficacy. And then we have on the 16th of November, I believe, we have the Moderna vaccine come out. And right now, we are in a phase where there are more people who are thinking, okay, the economy is going to recover. In 2021, I think a lot of people in their heads want to believe that the economy will be better starting from January next year, right? And there's also this expectation that it's important to know this is that until January, there is no confirmation yet. There is no of the president. There is a contested election. There is a deadlock in Congress and Senate. Uh, I'm saying that right now, but maybe they'll come up with a stimulus plan uh, today. I don't know, but every day they're saying they're going to come out with a stimulus plan, but uh, it's not out. So, you know, it's hard to say. I think most likely it's like very probable that a stimulus plan will come out next year. Um, so there's a lot of investors that are like, yeah, maybe like if I made, if they bought earlier during the year in before March, and right now they're looking at almost end of the year and they want to close some of their accounts and they want to close their books and they want to um, lock in their profits and get their end of year bonuses and so on. People are going to, uh, some traders will, will sell at this point. And I think we're going to see a stronger decline in the gold and silver prices before the end of the year. How much is it going to go down? I, I don't know. I really don't know how much it will go down. I just can see that in the charts, it says that there is potentially we are in a bear market, right? Should you be worried in the long term? Um, honestly, I think you don't really have to be worried so much in the long term. At least if you look at how, you know, gold has performed over, uh, let's see, since, yeah, it's, uh, it's not the most volatile commodity out there. I mean, there was a period after 2000 and I would say to, between 2000 and, uh, and let's see here, 2012, the last high peak, which was in the 1800s. And uh, we reached almost 1900s. And uh, 2016, which was a long-term bear market, it was also a period of extremely strong economic recovery, right? I don't think we're going to see that level of growth in the near term. It's very unlikely to see such, to reach the same, I would say, economic strength um, compared to then. Now, is it possible that we reach, we recover really quickly and we see like double digit growth, triple digit growth? Um, maybe, maybe not. But you have to remember, at this moment, there is quite a lot of unemployment. Recovery is slowing down. That means that the short-term gains have slowed down. This is something that they mentioned. And, they, they, and on, I believe there's a, quite a few uh, lending facilities that the Federal Reserve will have to close before uh, end of year. And uh, we don't know what, what type of effect that will have on the markets. Um, we don't know if uh, the fact that if, for example, right now, a lot of homeowners and also commercial like real estate owners, are, they're in forbearance. But that comes to an end. There's a lot of cliffs at the end of the year. And we don't know what the beginning of the year will look like if we have so many cliffs, right? That means that past January 1st, um, I don't know if Congress is going to come in and just like Congress and Senate. I mean, the Congress can vote on a bill and can go, it has to be approved by Senate. So pretty much we're in a Senate deadlock. If it goes to Senate, um, will it go through? And will all of a sudden there'll be stimulus and then people are going to be like, sort of, you know, it's not so much that I'm saying that all these businesses are not viable businesses. In the midterm, I don't know if in the long term they're viable businesses, but in the midterm, if these businesses are viable or not, 
But in the short term, none of these businesses like retail, um, I'm not talking about food retail, I'm talking about like, I don't know, electronics retail, um, what else, travel, travel retail, and hospitality, restaurants. I mean, restaurants do now do delivery, but also restaurants have a, have a issue is that, you know, delivery, they're only doing 50% of their actual numbers. So, but I think in the short term, at least until the end of the year, we're gonna see a bear market. And depending on what happens in January, um, it could, we could see a reversion, right? So I was like, okay, how do I maybe like, try and figure out wh what will gold look like, depending on all the market aspects, the current market aspects. And uh, I, you know, I was like, yeah, um, let's go and uh, look at the stochastics, maybe that'll help. And no, because like it's saying that currently in the short term, because there's no uh, upside, um, we are actually confirming kind of into a, uh, in the current price range. I don't think we're going to move out of the current price range. Um, and all our MCAT oscillators are negative the long term. It was starting to go sort of neutral. And then I was like, okay, maybe like we're going to confirm in the neutral level, but no. I think we're going to go downwards, a slow bear market. We're not going into a crash before the end of the year. Um, at least that's what the charts and these indicators, at least from my interpretation of these indicators, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm not an expert. So I was thinking, I'm not an expert. I'm not super good at reading charts and I'm not that great at reading charts. So maybe I can like use somebody's like uh, some other way to try and do technical analysis across multiple charts and uh, have basically my computer do it for me, right? <laughs> and I was thinking, how do I do that? I need to teach the computer patterns and it needs to look at the graphs and try to make patterns and understand patterns and, um, and, uh, and determine what will be future prices based on the best fit of current market information. Of course, it cannot predict things that are outside of the market. It, could, it would never be able to predict um, a, a vaccine, a 90% efficacy vaccine, right? It would never be able to predict that, for example, um, I don't know. It would never be able to predict that policy changed on uh, December 31st and then Congress doesn't pass like the policy and suddenly there's a massive amount of people who walk away from their mortgages and uh, it completely destroys the uh, CMBS market, the commercial mortgage-backed security market. And that leads to a knock-on effect for different pensions, banks, and so on. It could never predict that there's a policy change in the stock market because uh, lending facilities from the Federal Reserve have to be closed and because uh, the Treasury wants to close it before the end of the year. It can't predict outside external policy factors. Those are fundamental analysis parts. But it can predict things that based on the current market conditions, what will be if it continues like it is, what will the market look like? In let's say, in this case, I'm taking a 22 day period horizon. So uh, I went online and I looked at you know what was done and I found like actually some, some, somebody was doing this in April. And uh, I was like, okay, so he's a specialist. His name is uh, Mohammed Riazuddin. Uh, I totally butchered his name, but I'll put the link in the um, in the um, in the video so you can see what he did. And pretty much, he it's sort of like it's not a fully serious project. This this is not like uh, hardcore. <laughs> like this isn't this is similar, but but it's not like it's highly, highly uh, verified the model, right? What he's doing. And what I'm doing is not verified either. I don't have other experts coming in and then looking at what I build and then determining if it's viable or not, whether I made too much uh, of a um, overfitting of the model based on past data and so on. Essentially, it's, it's basically just a demonstration of concept, but we could use it. And if it does perform better than me at technical analysis, that's all I need. I don't need to perform better than an expert because I just need it to perform better than myself. <laughs> that's the only thing. And I think uh, I'm pretty bad at technical analysis. So I'm like, eh, probably it will be better than me. So I decided to sort of adapt his program to uh, my local environment 
and also my uh, basically what I wanted to look at. So his approach was to take machine learning and then to use it to predict, to use uh, regression and predict the future of gold over a two to three week period. Um, he's using historical returns from different, uh, different types of assets. And uh, basically there's a few libraries with, uh, with, um, with Python that you can use, such as Panda for data visualization analysis, uh, Matlib for mathematical formulas, and uh, Yahoo Financials, which contain all the financial data, which is really cool because suddenly you get a ton of financial data starting, uh, dating all the way back for certain things back to the 1980s. I was like looking at, excuse me. And um, basically uh, it takes your information from a ticker. He uses, I think, gold, silver, crude oil, uh, S and P 500, the Russell 2000, uh, Treasury notes, platinum, copper, dollar, the VIX index, soybean, um, uh, the emerging markets ETF funds, the US dollar, uh, Euro USD, Euronext, um, Nasdaq. I also took me. I put in some crypto. I put in crypto 200, Bitcoin. Um, I also. I put in, I think, uh, a few other currencies like the Swiss franc because I buy and sell in Swiss francs. And um, it, it really shouldn't affect so much of the market, but I was like thinking maybe I, it's better also add some safe haven currencies and some cryptocurrencies, which are not in his analysis, at least in the, in the factors that he considers as part of his analysis. And um, I also took in individual markets. I was like, yeah, the, you know, he's taking in some ETFs, but some of these individual markets could drag the, um, you know, they, these individual markets are traded somewhat a little bit like they might have, you know, different contributing factors. So they might contribute more. And uh, I just added them to like just experiment. Um, I don't know if it's viable or not. I added the, the Gacahon DAX and uh, the FTSE, I think uh, 500 and, um, and I added also some Asian markets, not just emerging market. I added specifically different Asian markets like the Hang Seng, uh, which is the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And um, I added also the Yuan. I think he doesn't have the Yuan in here. I add the Yuan to dollar ratio too. And um, so to take a little bit more into consideration, uh, China as, a, um, as part of the analysis or the learning pattern. And then uh, the range, he took it from the more modern ranges. That means that the more modern prices of gold and silver. And I want to take in more crashes. That means that I wanted more uh, periods where we had more extreme volatility. And so I took it from 1980. I don't know if that's really a great idea. Uh, <laughs> I could be like, I could be like, could actually make my model um, rely too much on much older historical data um, rather than more modern historical, more modern data. Um, but I was like, yeah, let's just put it stuff in and then we'll fine tune it. This is just one episode I'm doing. And then uh, he's doing stuff. He's basically actually cleaning the data and just taking the data he needs. And then we are, and he builds like the raw values. And then from it, he builds a bunch of correlations basically out of it. And, um, He's calculating different historical returns. There's a cleaning of the data and so on. And then he does an evaluation of the models of what tends to give out the best correlations. And then we run what's called tuning. So you, some, you can tune your models to make them more fit. The, um, the, uh, the, basically the data you have. So it's predictor it can, it's sort of like based on your historical and testing data, it fits better the the, uh, what do you call it? The expected results, but what happens is you're also introducing bias from your historical data. So it makes generalization a little bit more difficult. Basically, it's like somebody who bases all his decisions on uh, past information, nothing on intuition. If that, if we were to call it like what a person does is that he's general, he doesn't, he's not generalizing something. Um, he's over confirming. So if, if that's how you would put it, for example, if you see um, a, a crow and it's black and it flies and you see only black crows, you assume that all crows in the world are black. That's kind of like the 
how you would explain overfitting for human. Of course, most crows in the world are black, but you also have albino crows. And if you overfit, the person who sees the albino crow will believe that it's not a crow. He can't generalize it because he's overtuned <laughs> in some ways. That's how, how you can put it. Um, how do you know when you've overtuned? Uh, you, it's kind of more like oh, you have to test it out. <laughs> and it takes time. And uh, this is, I just did, I think, two iterations. And uh, I did 150 iterations with K and then tune, but I did uh, two runs, so over two days. And of course, I'm projecting a 22 day horizon like he's doing in his example. I'll post, like I said, I'll post a link and I'll, I will also post my results from the, um, the program and I will I haven't uploaded my code yet because I did something different so I took what he was doing and I took all his like formulas and everything and essentially I adapted it to my uh, current build environment which is um, which sorry that's my uh, camera stuff oops 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 that's not so I've adapted to my own build environment and I don't have all of the, the libraries he has installed directly on my computer. I put it in something called a container. Uh, it's Docker that I'm using. So I'm installing pip and so on. I install Python and uh, in my tickers list. Uh, let's see, unsupported text on you want to open any open. Ah, shit. Uh, let's open this open show in uh, whatever. Anyways, I have my tickers. I have more data in it. I have, uh, actually, it's good if I show you guys this, a reveal room finder, and I have a tickers list, and we have here, yeah, I was looking. So from 1989, you can see that there is no Bitcoin <laughs> data, so the correlation is zero. Uh, it's not influenced, but there's NASDAQ and there's Swiss franc. Well, it doesn't have data for Swiss franc. Um, it's mainly after 2000, you have complete data, but ticker list. Anyways, I took, I took also, uh, the CNBS market, the Hang Seng, Nikkei, the crypto 2000, which is an index fund of, uh, cryptocurrencies. I didn't know it existed, but uh, it's an index fund of cryptocurrencies, BTC and, uh, the Swiss franc, like I said, and, uh, I don't know if I have the yuan potential that I have the Hang Seng. I didn't add the yuan in this case. So yeah, uh, so mine is a little bit different adapted to, to I uh, just wanted to try something a little bit different adapted. Also, I adapted this code to my environment. Um, when I upload this, I will do another video when I finally refined it to a point where I feel comfortable sharing this content. Um, I will share it and I'll put it on GitHub. I'll put it in a container. So if you have ever used containers, it's relatively easy. Um, it lets you build a program with all of its dependent libraries and programs and data uh, within a contained unit without you having to install it on your, on your computer. And uh, all I have to do is specify it within a, uh, within, a, uh, within a requirements file what you need to run this program, all the dependencies. And uh, basically the container Docker, uh, which is a container program, will install it for you on your on within a virtual machine on your computer that it creates and it runs a program and it does take some time to run the the program depending on how much you allocate to docker i think i was running it on uh six threads at 16 um uh, with 16 gigabytes of ram so basically my whole computer and it was like an hour of training for the computer to learn uh, how to uh, create its models and to build the 22 day model. Um, it's not so hard for it to do the, um, to do the data cleaning. But the part that's most intensive is actually, I think doing the KN and tune models, 150 to 50 iterations. And when you finish making the model, um, you don't actually need to relearn, teach a computer, all the models, it saves the models in what's called a PKL file. Uh, and essentially this is the model. And you can see that when I was doing the training, it created a log of all the different, this is a cap boost, which I ran through uh, its boosted iterations. And, uh, and then I have other events out here too. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then time left. 
Oh, let's see, is this in seconds? Yeah, past, uh, <laughs> yeah, 1,700 seconds. It goes, the more iterations, the less the slower it becomes. So this is why typically you have really powerful graphics cards running these programs to, uh, to speed up the, the learning process. And here from the data, I also plot, there's a plot of the uh, regressors and uh, the, uh, what they call, uh, the, uh, basically the expectation. And it's kind of interesting when you look at what correlates with the rise of price of gold um, and the general correlation of how the price of gold evolves. Like if you think about the fundamental aspect of gold is gold is insurance. Gold is insurance against uh, gold is insurance against monetary risk and uh, government inf government inflationary caused inflationary risk. And in periods of, I would say, uh, certainty and low turmoil, gold is almost consistently on the downward trend, right? If your government is not printing money like crazy, it will, and they keep like their money printing speed at a relatively like, reasonable amount um, and they aim to keep like both all asset markets out of a bubble and they aim to create real there's a real like growing economy gold has no reason to increase in price right because it's insurance and the probability of having a terrible event happening is relatively low so over time um, most cases gold in the future 22 days in the future it's going to be cheaper. It's deflationary, but the reason behind it is because there's nothing terrible is happening. And as long as nothing terrible is happening, gold's price will go on a slow. It's not a fast downward trend. You can see that, you know, half 50% of the cases for a 14 day period, for example, in this case is, uh, is relatively negative, but not too much. You know, it's, it's close to the zero point, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it has a negative bias, right? If you look at the 22 days, it's a little bit more positive. That means it's closer to zero. But if I zoom in quite a bit, you can see that it is still negative, not as strongly negative as the uh, as a 14 day, but it's still somewhat negative because in a longer time period, also compared to a shorter time period, in 14 days, it's very unlikely you have a market crash, but within 20 days, you could have um, unexpected events in the longer period. I think if you take over a 30 year period, uh, gold tends to be positive. <laughs> you know, if you take a 30 year prediction, you say like, okay, today's price of gold is 1871. Uh, I can tell you in 30 years, gold is going to be worth more than, than that. I can say it was pretty good certainty that it's going to be that i think you would have this similar distribution but around the two percent mark right you have a uh, sort of a plus or minus um i would say plus or minus 0 0.5 around two percent that's kind of uh in the long term for gold and uh so in the 22 range the horizon is pretty good and the basically the machine is saying like okay i can see from all the data you put in that in longer periods, gold tends to be more valuable because there are bad events that happen um, relative to a very short period in 14 days. And, um, but it still trends a little bit to the negative because 22 days relative to how the world evolves, it's, it, is, uh, it is still short, you know, it's still short. Um, so the, it tends still a little bit to negative, but there are certain things that make it drive it positive, right? And basically when we're, what we're going to teach the machine is to pick out like which factors at certain points are stronger than others and whether it's going to lead to a more positive outcome. That means that we're going to have a, a upward swing in the price of gold or a downward swing in the price of gold. And that's what this like training process does. Um, and, uh, oops, somebody turned on the TV. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> the TV turned on by itself. I think I hit the remote. Uh, so we're going, we might cut that out. Uh, so we're talking about the training models. It trains everything and it has these learning, uh, iterations. And basically it, we save the model 
And then I will cr I created a second uh, project with a different source file and its own container. It contains similar things to the first project. And um, basically it's to not run the whole process of relearning everything again. And it's just going to use a model and uh, using that model, it runs basically a 22 day uh, horizon price projection. And uh, the results are quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'll share my results. I'll, I'm going to update them daily because it's how I'm going to track my, uh, my predictions. Um, I don't know if these are going to realize, you know, there's a difference between running the, running the program and having a predicted results. And, you know, over a long period of time, you cannot confirm that it's, it's a, a valid model based upon only like, we're not even in December yet. So 22 days from today is actually in the middle of December. Um, even if I hit like the right price, you know, it's like, if it's like 99.999% accurate, it doesn't mean that it predicts the future. It means that it, it might've gone lucky. You have to be able to consistently predict the future price with your model. Um, and, uh, in this case, I don't know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but based upon the information I fed it and whatever came out, uh, it's quite interesting is that, you know, it's saying that the price of gold is actually going to go to a downwards trend. And I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, that, that, that is interesting. It's actually going to go almost, uh, downwards towards 2%. And there's a certain point where, you know, on uh, November 13th, I think that was before November 13th is, is, uh, <clears throat> November 13th is a few days right after the crash. And I think we did have some upward momentum in the price of gold. Um, it was thinking that maybe we still would be able to go upwards, but after November 13th, we had the Pfizer, the, the Moderna vaccine, and we can see a clear trend that now there's like, there's a growing space between the uh, short-term exponential moving average and the long-term exponential moving average. And I can see that in my predictions that, you know, after the, the 13th, that means that the 16th, 17th, and so on, and where it's predicting, I think there might be an error. I'm missing the 14th and so on. Huh? Uh, it's coming out with results where it says, wait a second. Ah, it didn't do Saturday sun. I think, is that it? It's 13th. Yes, it is. 13th was a Friday. So it's not doing weekend predictions. That's something I might have to correct. Um, yeah, it should be doing weekend predictions too, because the closing price of gold doesn't end on, uh, on a, uh, on a uh, weekday, I think it stopped because the stock market stopped. And uh, but gold and silver are still traded over the weekend. So it's going to have to take that into, that might be something I have to change with the program to have it take into consideration the price of gold and silver over the weekends. So what do we have here? We have um, that the, our machine, a robot is predicting that, uh, predict the basically from the model that it learned from the data we fed it from 1980 until today based upon uh, the different types of assets uh it believes well i don't know if you can say it believes but it thinks let's say it thinks that we're in a bear market and the price of gold is going to go down almost to the 1800 the low 1800s level like on the 20th of the 12th of December, we're going to see 18, 1800. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that, that's a pretty pessimistic view, but, but okay. I can see like why it's making this prediction because there is a strong case for a bear market. Um, yeah, I did. When I looked at the data, the correlation data, um, I have something here, which is called, uh, let's see, do I have numbers out? Yes. 
numbers. So I did look a little bit at this. It's a little bit hard to visualize. I think um, in what the, the original creator of the initial script, he made, there's, he's using something called Jupiter. And I think it's a specialized, it's a little bit more specialized than what I'm using. I'm, I have a general purpose environment and I'm using a Visual Studio. Um, I, might inst I might check out to actually install Jupyter, see what the model is actually doing um, and what factors contribute more. But I think in his initial analysis, he, he had this was, um, he had his, his predicting the gold price. In his predictor, the most important aspect for him was the price of silver over 250 day, 252 days ago and the price of gold 180 days ago. The emerging, emerging markets uh, fund, the price of silver 90 days ago, the price of silver 180 days ago, uh, gold, and then the S&P uh, 500, right? 250 days, over 250 days period. Um, what does it mean? It means that I think, you know, uh, yeah, gold is affected by its previous price quite a lot. It's also affected by the price of silver. That's kind of surprising, but not surprising at all because gold and silver tend to be relatively correlated, right? Um, and also be affected by the emerging markets. And I think the original creator of this, um, this script, he explained that it's quite uh, normal that emerging markets, they, they lock in their profits and they close the balance of their portfolio and gains in their portfolio with gold. This is something that is relatively normal for emerging markets. And uh, which makes sense, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like, if you look at technical analysis in its own bubble and you get data from technical analysis and you're not able to, and you read this and suddenly here, you know, you suddenly see instead of gold and emerging markets, you see something like, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, CHF and uh, USD as one of the most important factors. Um, the, or maybe like Australian dollar and the dollar you know, you, you might question, you're like, yeah, that doesn't like, there's a correlation, but correlation, there's no real causality maybe, unless Australia is a major trading partner with the United States, but it's not, it is a trading partner, it's a strategic partner, but it's not a main trading partner. So, you know, why would it be important? Um, that could be like one of the reasons why, you know, then your model, you should put your model into question and look if there's errors. His model seems to be relatively consistent with actually what the real world does. And that's why I took his, um, his script. And I mean, the guy knows much more about like financial markets than I do and how people behave in financial markets. So, uh, so yeah, um, I haven't seen people comment him. Oh, maybe I'll plus I, uh, yeah. Pie carrot is a sort of like relatively lightweight, um, it's not lightweight, it's code sim like code light in terms of uh, machine learning, but it's not a deep neural net. I think there, there might be an extension for PyCarrot for neural, neural networks. Um, it's pretty cool what he did. And uh, when I finish doing, uh, when I finish cleaning up my, my uh, modifications for it, I will put this up in GitHub and I will have, uh, I'll have to create a Silver Dave GitHub account with uh, Docker and everything, and um, and the 22 day model, I might do uh, I might do a few models that you can use. So I could do a 14 day regressor, and I could do a uh, and this one will be called the 22 day regressor from 1980, and I could do a, a few with different time periods. You know, I could build a regressor, for example, for a time period between 2006 and 2010. So during the, in the house, the, the great recession, and then I can do another uh, sort of a, sort of an indicator for the period where we had the, the uh, gold slump. And then I can do another indicator, which is more recent. That means that since 2016, post 2016 until 2010, 
and uh, and today, which is 2020 and 2021. Um, that could be something I could do. It, it would take me a, a bit more time to do the training models and then to figure out like the different stuff with modifying his code and I'll cleaning, I'll try and clean it up a bit because it's uh, it's not really designed for reuse, the code he used. And I, I, I mean, I just took whatever he wrote and uh, I tried to understand the things I needed to understand. I didn't like, I don't understand all of it. I understand a lot of it, but I don't understand all of it. And um, I might have to check the intermediate outputs of Yahoo Financials to see how he's cleaning his uh, data, which is a JSON file, so it shouldn't be too hard to figure out how he's cleaning it. Um, I can see he's cleaning it in uh, quite, I'm not too familiar with pandas, so I can, I think he's, he, there's a lot of stuff from pandas for cleaning out um, data, it seems, and it's pretty powerful. So I'll have to look up the, um, the uh, APIs of pandas to uh, to see what I can, how maybe like we can clean the data a little bit different and see uh, see how it changes our predictions. Um, so there's two parts to this video. Obviously, you know we looked at the uh, we looked at how you know the basic graphical technical analysis, which is easy to understand. And then there is the less obvious, uh, you know, days machine learning output. Um, like the, I think the fun part is that I did this technical analysis and I ran the program for the machine. And I was like in the mindset that, you know, possibly we are in a bear market and we're going to see future lower prices. I think we're going to see lower prices in the future, at least until the beginning and or beginning of next year. Um, do I think that in afterwards, like, so here's how I think, like f my fundamental analysis is this. So long as the cases for COVID keep rising and so long as people have more fear and so long as the vaccine does not roll out and is not available for everybody, so long as there's disputes within the government, so long as there's no stimulus, so long as Democrats and Republicans cannot agree to work together, um, you will have more damage to the economy, right? It's not so much about ideologically who's right or who's wrong. It's so it's more about, you know, uh, getting two parties and getting the two parts of the country to work together to come to a solution to the current situation, right? and to try things to get, make the situation better. Uh, but I think at the, in the current atmosphere, it is just not realistic, right? And I think that overall, it will slowly drag, be a drag on the price of gold because people are expecting stimulus, it's not gonna happen. But if you want the price of gold to shoot up, it's not really a bad thing. See, like I was talking to a friend and they also buy gold and they were like, I told them, yeah, the price of gold is we're probably in a bear market and we're going to see lower prices of gold. And they're like, yeah, but that just means that it'll go up afterwards sometime. I was like, that's true. <laughs> you know, it's coming down right now. Um, and if you're cost averaging and you're just still buying cost averaging over the time and you're going in a little bit like, I don't know, $300 a month, you really have nothing to worry about. You know, and especially if you're cost averaging for like, you know, 30 years, you really have nothing to worry about in terms of the price of gold. Um, I think you'll be perfectly fine. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's quite interesting that it's, um, it's that, you know, I have this result, of course, I'll update it. And then we'll see in 22 days, I'll do a part two of this video. And we'll see the first results of whether we're going to hit, I don't think we're hitting 1920 on the, on the fifth. Uh, I think we're going to, I'll, this one is sort of an outlier. It's not really valid. Let's delete row here. Okay. So from the 16th, that, I think that was from my first run. I didn't have like, <laughs> there's some parameters I didn't put in. Um, but I would say that from the 16th until the 8th of December. So in 
18 days, let's see what will be the first result, right? Let's see what will, what, uh, what the gold price will be, what will be the predicted gold price um, on the 22 day horizon. Uh, thank you for watching. Today's video was a bit long. There's, there were some complicated parts. So, you know, if you tuned out of it, it's like, I understand. Um, but Fridays, yeah, tomorrow I'll be showing some new coins I got, uh, from my local coin shop and, uh, they are not Swiss coins. There is one French coin, which is really interesting. And, uh, and yeah, thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe. I post daily content. Uh, click the like button. It really helps out the videos. And uh, leave a comment on what you think and what you want to see for future content. And thank you so much for watching the video. This is Dave. Have a good evening. Keep stacking and stacking good health. Dave out.